And the rest of us, we're going to be in Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. I hope that you're enjoying reading this every week uh, after week and just you get a feel for reading it over and over again. It's a good thing to do, good thing to do. Let me pray for us and we'll begin. Heavenly Father, you are the name above all names and every man and every woman will go the way of all the earth and we will all turn, return to the dust from which we've came until we stand before the judge, our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, and we thank you that, there, that we will, because of him, what he's done, as he looks upon us and uh, the Father looks upon us, we will be clothed in the righteousness of him, his very person, uh, that he will clothe us on the inside to be righteous in something that we know that we do not have. Father, we also know that you have warned against those who would dare approach you in judgment without being clothed in the Son of God, without his sacrifice, that judgment awaits, from, awaits them and it does not end well. Lord, glorify yourself in giving us opportunities to share Christ as, uh, as you see fit with our neighbors, our friends, our families, to sow seeds and let others water or to water what others have sown and then let you place people where you think they need to be. Glorify yourself in all these things and for your glory. And Lord, now open our hearts to your word and your word to our hearts. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Chapter 1. This is the revelation of Jesus, the anointed Messiah which God gave to him. I want you to know something. It didn't say that God unsheathed him or uncovered him or revealed him. It says it was something that God gave to him. The revelation, what's revealed in this book, was given to him as a book to Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show to his slaves those things which must shortly take place. He sent and he communicated by his messenger angel to his slave John. And again, the book is written to those who are the slaves of our Lord and to no one else who bore witness of the word of God to the testimony of Jesus the Messiah, even to everything that he saw. Blessed is he who is the reader. As are those who hear the words of this prophecy, who are also the doers of those things which are written in it, because the time is near. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, who is to come. Now notice that at this point in time is the Father. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne, there's the spirit, and from Jesus Christ, there's the son, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, that is, he's the first one who has ever risen up with eternal life, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has released us from our sins by his blood. And he has made us to be a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be the glory and the dominion forever. And ever. Amen. Let that be so. <clears throat> Behold, he's coming with the clouds, as a cloud of witness, cloud of saints, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, even those who were dead will see him coming. And all of the tribes of the earth will mourn over him, even so, amen, let it happen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the all controlling one. I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and the kingdom and perseverance which are in Jesus, I was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in spirit. That is not there. I was in spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. And it said, write in a book the things which you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, Pergamum, and to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, to Laodicea. I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. In the middle of the lampstands was one like a son of man. He was clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet, and girded about the breast, not the waist, but the breast with a golden belt. His head and his hair were white like wool, like snow. His eyes were like flaming fire. And his feet were like burnished bronze when it has been caused to glow in a furnace. And his voice was as the sound of many waters. 
In his right hand he held seven stars. Out of his mouth came a sharp, two-edged broadsword. And his face was like the sun, shining in its, in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as a dead man. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death. And I also have the keys of Hades, the unseen realm. Right? Therefore, the things which you have seen, the things which are, the things which are going to take place after these things, as for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the messengers or angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Okay. Now, this is important. When you see Jesus Christ, who's he writing to? The seven churches. Who's he talking to? The seven churches. Okay. I want you to notice that his garb addressing the church today is... With a sword, bronze burning, fiery feet, fire in his eyes. And he's talking to whom? He's talking to the churches, all right? Okay. Uh, let me give you an example of uh, a harmful nice guy. Okay. Have you ever seen these little promise books? Have you seen those? Books just full of verses of promises. Have you ever seen a book full of wrath promises? Why would we leave those out, right? All right. You know, my, my wife is an avid reader, and one of the things that she's done over the years is she, was, she would buy these devotionals. You know what these devotionals are, right? A reading for the day. And for a time, she just threw them away and, got, and quit reading them. She said, because all these promises that they're doing in there, all these devotions, those verses are all out of context, they don't mean what they say. These are people trying to encourage you by twisting the word of God and twisting the word of God's heart and his mind and his posture towards us and perverting it. Is that encouraging to you? I hope not. I hope it's offensive. All right. Uh, I would categorize some of the modern praise music as identical. When they throw it up there and it's praise and praise and praise, it's the same four or five words or four or five lines over and over again. They just mix them up, put them in a Yahtzee cup, shake them up, put them out, and there's the new verses. And out, out, out they come. And some of these things are, are written by people who don't know the Word of God, and they're, they're written by people who look at this and think, you know, it's all about the emotion. It's really not about content and truth and, and, and those things. And let me, let me illustrate this, okay? With today's technology, can we give you a light show? Oh, yeah. Can we put smoke up on the stage? Oh, yeah. Can we make and just whisper and cater to your emotions. Yes, we can. All right. Remove the microphones. Put us all outside on the grass. Is anybody going to whisper when they're teaching? Why wouldn't you? Nobody can hear what you're saying, right? And you, when you're singing and you're leading the song, you also can't go, praise Jesus, oh Lord. You can't do that either because people can't hear you. Right? And people don't have hymnals. And people didn't have anything over the years. They used to, the church used to sing solely psalms. Did you know that? That's all they sang was the psalms. I think. And it was a good way to teach, a good way to learn. So, and I'm just saying that so that we put ourselves in that context. Because the Jesus that we're looking at here has not changed. Right? Malachi says, I am the Lord God. I don't change. I've never changed. And when Jesus opened up his ministry, he walked into the temple and he saw what was going on. Do you remember what he did? He started kicking tables over. And he made a whip. And what did he do with that? He started driving the animals out. And looked at the scribes and the Pharisees and said, you guys are hypocrites. Yes, I said it loud enough for the crowd to hear. You're, you're hypocrites. How will you escape the damnation of the fires of hell? How are you going to get out of the flames? How are you going to escape it? You're going to face me in judgment. It doesn't end well for you. Government officials, you go tell Herod that fox that I'm going to serve the Lord and I'm going to do it his way, regardless of him. We do those kind of things. And when Jesus Christ talked that way, that he has not changed. Okay? What does Jesus think of hypocrisy? Beware of this, he said. Beware of this. And then he said, if you exalt yourself, you'll be put down. Right? And if you will humble yourselves, I will exalt you in that in proper time and in due time. Okay? This is the same Lord who has talked to us in the Gospels. This is the same Lord who appeared all through the Old Testament. He is the angel of the Lord. Do you know the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament? The word angel is the word Malachi. Okay? 
And so when you see the book of Malachi, it's probably not a prophet. It's a term for a messenger. That's all it is. And many men are messengers, etc. And Malachi in the Old Testament, I think of him approaching Balaam and said, I would have killed you, etc. Did you know in 1 Corinthians 11, God says he's, he's literally taking the life of some of his people. He says, some of you are asleep. God has taken you out of this world and taken you uh, home to, uh, to heaven because you're not discerning things and you're living sinfully. Uh, what God has for a standard of when he decides to remove a sinning Christian, a woman or a man, I do not know. I, I, he hasn't informed me of that. All right. Now, before I get into the text today, uh, we're going to begin at verse 12, but um, there's a, a method to my madness. I got some pictures here, and I want to make sure that I don't do anything illegal f f with copyright issues. And so if somebody contacts us and says, I own the copyright to that picture, immediately we're going to go in there to the video and take it out. That's what we're, we're going to do. So. Let's uh, put up our first slide, please. Right. Okay, we're doing, we're doing well. All right, John the Apostle, this is not him. This is a picture. Uh, we don't know what he looked like. It's like we don't know the, what Jesus looked like. Think. I don't know what comes to your mind, but we don't know what he looked like. We have one ancient description of him, by the way, historically, that he had raven black hair and a raven black, black beard, which was parted in the center. Picture his beard going this way and this way. Parted, combed, okay? Neat looking kind of thing. I, I know the potter, posture today is for preachers to stand up here in shorts and sandals and a dirty t-shirt that hasn't been washed in three weeks and hair not, not combed kind of thing. So you can draw attention to yourself which is what that's about. All right. Jesus Christ is standing among the seven golden lampstands. So let's go back in time to the next slide here. And I want, it, I want you to notice something. By the way, this picture here, this is uh, real. This is from the Temple Museum. Did you know that the furniture for the temple has been rebuilt? Did you know that a high priest has been appointed by the Sanhedrin? Did you know the court of the Sanhedrin is there? This is all there. Kind of thing. We're going to deal with that when we get to chapter 11 here. But um, that thing is as tall as me, maybe a little bit a little bit taller. In the Old Testament, this is solid gold. And gold is the, is the metal of glory because it illustrates um, the character of God. And it means to be weighty, <clears throat> uh, kind of thing. The, the word glory means weight, so you speak of the eternal weight of glory, uh, etc. <clears throat> but I want you to notice that Jesus is among seven golden lampstands. It's not this one. This one was the one that was built for the tabernacle. And when they did away with the tabernacle, went to the temple, it was moved inside to the temple. And when you first went into the holy place, it would be on the left. The temple faced the east, the sun rising. So when you walk into the temple, uh, you were walking, and on your left would be the menorah, th this lamp, and on the right would be the table of showbread. It's got, and the table of showbread, was, it's got 12 loaves, great big loaves of bread, huge things, uh, kind of thing. And um, 12 loaves, for obviously, for the 12 tribes, right? And uh, the ins there's another bit of bread, by the way, uh, one omer that was put inside the Holy of Holies, inside the Ark of the Covenant, and that was one man's rations for one day. So when Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread, that's obviously what he was referring to. And he fed the multitudes twice. One was right down to the last man, and the other one was, was uh, plenty left, left over. All right. And you will notice that seven lamps here, but there's only one lamp stand. And what you see at the top there is in the shape of almonds. And God is very clear about that. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> I wanted to show you something. In the tabernacle... Um, it sat in a room of gold. It had a tapestry over the top, but in a room of, of, of gold. So the light is showing you the glory of God. That's what it is. Okay? Now, there's a verse in the Psalm that says, In your light we will see light. There is a light from God that no man in this world can see. I can't see it and you can't see it until I know the Lord and I go in there. And in His light I begin to understand that His glory is all that matters. That is what matters. And what do I see as an expression of His glory? I see light, which is synonymous with truth in the Bible. I see the truth of the way things are. I see reflections of His glory everywhere. I, and I also see bread. And He's providing for me and for you. 
that he feeds his people. All right, give us this day our daily bread. I'm not, you're not going to starve. I'm going to seek first the kingdom of God. These other things will be taken care of you. And then there's an altar of incense, where Hebrews actually says belongs on the inside of the tapestry in the Holy of Holies, but it's on this side. Where, and he says these are the prayers of the saints. That in, in there it is the glory of God that he communes with me and, and, and with you. And he actually speaks with me and speaks with you, right? I believe that that's what the Bible is. When, when, when the Bible is talking, God is talking to us and communicating with us. And so when I come before him, it's not, can I get a new Corvette? Can I get, I want to live in a mansion. Well, you might get spanked before you get out of there. Because life is not about that. And your treasures are supposed to be where? They're not supposed to be down here, right? They're supposed to be in heaven. All right, so... Uh, not my will be done, but yours be done, okay? Uh, the silver on the bottom of that, did you know the tabernacle, they put that silver, and that was made of redemption silver, I think? So it pictures uh, the redemption. I don't want to get lost on the tabernacle or the, or the temple because we'll never get out of here. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. But this part is, so, is solid gold. There's another piece in here that's solid gold as well, and that is in the Holy of Holies. Um, by the way, every bit of this furniture, every piece of furniture in Hebrew is called the Holy of Holies. This whole thing's a package, okay? And it's the holy, hakadosh, the holy of the hakadoshim, the holy of all the holy things. And if they're all the holy, that means they're all the same thing, right? And when you go into the holy of holies, you have in there, about the size of an army footlocker, you have a, a box, and it's made of acacia wood. Some of you would say uh, shatim wood, both true. And inside of, uh, on the top of that, there was a slab of solid gold, and it's called the mercy seat, and it's called the throne of God. He sits there, and he says, I will meet with you here, which is interesting. I won't meet with you anywhere else. I'll meet with you here. Now, to get there, of course, you have to go through the sacrifices and the washing and the light, and uh, it's hard to, to, to get in there, but that's solid gold. The rest of this stuff is made from the acacia tree. All right, next slide. Okay, this is an African tree. Okay, you've seen these on movies and pictures and uh, some things like that. Okay, now I want to ask you a question. Where do thorns come from? Curse. The curse. Very good. The rest of you have to repeat the course. <laughs> it comes from, it's the sign of the curse, right? Thorns and thistles, right? So what's Jesus wearing on the cross? A crown. You see it? He is the ruler over those, and he has joined among us as cursed as we are, right? Hence, he's down there getting baptized just like, like we are, getting in line. He's getting in line, All right? So he comes down here and he associates with us just like we get baptized now and we associate with him, uh, et cetera. But he wears that, the curse upon his head. He was born under the law, born under the curse, yet without sin, to redeem those who were under the law and under the curse, right? Uh, so this is a case of tree. Now... When God says he wants to build the tabernacle furniture, and what he did was he would build it out of wood and then gold plate it. So there's, there's a picture here in mind. Remember, in the book of Hebrews and Galatians, etc., it says that all the Old Testament, it's types and pictures and shadows, uh, etc. Right? Now, we used that example before. I can hold up an apple up here, and you can see the reflection of an apple, but you can't eat the shadow of an apple. You can't eat the shadow of a banana. Right? You can't do that, which is the problem when people park on those shadows and types, they can't see it. Like, like the Seven Day Adventists are. Some of them are definitely our brothers, but but they don't see the rest as it is applies to Jesus Christ. All they see is the shadow. They can't see anything beyond the shadow and the washings, etc. And the day of the week, they don't see that rest of, of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to give you a close up of the acacia tree. Next slide. What do you notice? It is a thorn tree. All right, now, you guys in construction, how would you like to have to mill this down and build something out of it? Okay? I couldn't think of a worse tree for God to build anything out of, kind of thing. But no, he said, no, this is what I want. I want this thorns because an expression of the, the Son of God. It's all about him, and God is going to plate this thing with glory. You're going you're to see that, and Jesus is going to wear these things, and it's fascinating that he does that. All right. So... First of all, this is not the Old Testament menorah kind of thing. Okay, next slide. We have Jesus walking among the 
seven church lampstands, which are, you notice each one sits in a community, it sits in a city, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, etc. So they're sitting there. And it's fascinating to me that God acknowledges that the Christian community in that city. Now, I know the church is divided and we're all split up kind of thing. Historically, that was not true. Usually, historically, when you went to a town, there was one, one assembly there. You went to church there and it's all it was. Uh, kind of thing. You didn't just hop down to the next thing. Today, we, we you can shop for a church. You can go to, like it's like going to Walmart. On what aisle is? These are my views. What aisles are those on? Kind of thing. Uh, and people choose churches for all uh, kinds of reasons, and uh, some some noble, some very ignoble, uh, etc. But uh, that's just catering to you, itching ears and, and, and lust. All right. You will notice how Jesus here is dressed. You can't see any bronze feet. He should be there in the, um, the broadsword coming out of his mouth. is not uh, there. But now notice where the golden band is. It is up, not on his waist, but it's up high. That golden band is going to match the judgments of uh, chapter uh, 15 and 16. Uh, the angels that come out, they are dressed like this. This is a garment of a judge, and that's what, he, what he's doing. Okay. Now, um, each lampstand represents the church community in, in one city, in one, one town. Next slide. These have been pointed out. They say they're in a circle. I would argue it's not a very good circle. But you'll notice that it's like he is walking on this geography or the terrain between them. So at the bottom left-hand side, you start at Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergam, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea, and that's the pattern of the churches that he's going to go. So he kind of walks among them. <coughs> Excuse me. And it's a great picture here that Jesus Christ, all around the world, he walks in different communities among his people. All right? Among his people. All right? Now, this garment, that when, the way he is dressed, okay, I actually read a commentary. He says, here he is in his priestly robe. Next slide. Is he wearing that priestly robe? No. Is it even remotely similar? No, he isn't wearing that. That was a conclusion jump to uh, kind of thing, uh, uh, etc. Uh, the priestly robe had its own symbols. You've got uh, the 12 stones on the chest for the 12 tribes of Israel. You've got six tribes on each shoulder because he upholds them. And you, by the way, the, the idea of being on your bosom is to be on his uh, heart, that he actually has affection. Okay. Uh, the high priest has a little plate up here that says, um, Holiness to the Lord. Holiness to Yahweh, that is, it's his forehead. The only thing he thinks about is God's holiness. He doesn't, he doesn't care about your car and your house and your junk. He really could care less. He's concerned about the holiness of God in your life. And from there, that other stuff, you can have it all, all you want, but the character that you must manifest in honoring him in every way and following his teachings is what, all that matters to him. None of that other stuff matters. I think. You know, who, who cares if you live in a camper your whole life or you live in a mansion your whole life? That means nothing. It means nothing. What matters is, 1 Corinthians 7, Paul says, all that matters is keeping the commandments of God. That's all that matters. And to say some, to a nitwit Christian today says that's just legalism. Obeying God's legalism? That is, those are the words of a fool. All i got to do is read Proverbs. A fool says in his heart, he, he just talks that way. He just talks that way. And the lack of the fear of God that we're facing today is incredible. Absolutely incredible. Not, not afraid to twist his words. Not afraid to take the scriptures completely out of the assembly. Not afraid to just preach his own mind. I'm just doing my own thing. I, I, evidently, my words are just as important as those of the Lord of the, crea the Creator himself. Well, that's absurd. That is ridiculous. That's rebellious. It's defiance to him. That's Balaam. That's Korah's rebellion, etc. Now, now, I want to show you one more picture. And next slide. On Yom Kippur, Yom is day, and Kippur means to cover or atonement. Yom Kippur is a day of atonement. The high priest had to take off all of his high priestly garment, and he stands there wearing white linen. And later on in Revelation, it says the white linen is the righteousness of the saints. So he, when the high priest goes in on Yom Kippur, he's got to go in there with his own righteousness, and that's what Jesus had to do. He literally had to come into the, God's presence in his own righteousness, right? But again, you'll notice how's he dressed. Is there any golden belt? There's not. Is there any breastplates? None of that is there. All of this is just to say that we're looking at Jesus Christ in a context of a, of a judge. All right? Now, there's a great verse that says, We judge one another. We judge those that are in the church assembly. 
Okay? We do do that. We must do that. Judge what I say. He says, but God judges those that are outside the assembly. So when he talks about in judgment, for example, in 1 Corinthians 5, he talks about a man who's committing adultery with his ancestral relationship uh, kind of thing. And he said, he said, here's the thing. I've already judged this man. When, when you gather assembly, this is a public matter. Everybody knows that when you're doing that, he said, remove him publicly. Okay? He says, we judge those that are in the church, and God rem- judges those that are outside the church, therefore put him out. And you put him out in order to get him back. You put him out in order that his, his soul may be saved in the day of, of, of redemption. Now, judging those with, with their in, inside the church, he says that in a context, man is being immoral. All right? So if I'm being immoral, you should judge me for that. You must pass judgment uh, using the scriptures as your guide and say, this is wrong for you to do this, right? And it's just as wrong if you do it, all right? And he says, a little leaven leavens everybody. Everybody gets contaminated by by this anti-God posture and this anti-God thinking, okay? All this BLM and the critical race theories and all that stuff going on, you understand he's swallowing that. People who don't know the Lord. I mean, there's no fear of God before their eyes, and they're just lost in all the social whatever kind of thing. And, you know, Jesus said, if you continue my word, you'll be free. If you don't, you're going to be a slave. That's how that's, how that's going to work. All right. That's all the slides. Now, let's go to verse, verse 12 here. And, and John, Jesus walks up and talks like a great big trumpet right behind him. And he turns to see the voice that was speaking with me. The Jews translate this. I turn to know the voice. And he sees seven golden lampstands. Okay? <clears throat> now, they're made of gold, and, and they have this beautiful glory that they are, or they should be. And they're kind of circling around the Lord Jesus Christ. And you'll notice that the churches are to be the gold. They are to bear the glory uh, of God. So that... When you use the term gold and you use the word glory, these terms are used interchangeably when God is describing the temple and he's describing the tabernacle. Uh, For example, you have the cherubim of glory and the cherubim of gold. If you've never seen a cherubim, don't... You guys ever read a commentary and you look and they show you a picture of a cherubim that's a little naked baby? You know, they haven't read the Bible, have they? When you read the cherubim, these are these majestic creatures. They're angelic uh, creatures. And cherub, uh, cherub is the same word for Jesus when he says, you say this sacrifice, is, this animal is Corban. Say, Korban, cherub, cherubim, cherubim, okay? And it's one angelic being with four distinct personalities or, or pictures of him, right? The eagle and the man and the, the ox. Um, 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 the other, oh, the lion, thank you. Uh, pictures of the four ministries of Jesus Christ, they were there. So each angel is one angel with four different distinct persons, etc. And not a trinity, but a, a quadrinity, as it were. <coughs> Excuse me. And these are called the cherubim of glory or the cherubim of gold. And God would put them in there. By the way, on that tapestry that stands between the holy place and the holy of holies, it says there's a cherubim on there. Right, those Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, behold your king. He's the face of the lion of the tribe of Judah. Mark is the face of the servant. Luke is the face of a man. And John, behold your God. He's the heavenly, heavenly one. So you can get into the God's presence through any one of those. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and and John. And they're the pillars that uphold that fleshly demonstration uh, of the Lord Jesus uh, uh, Christ. Now, our word gold is an English word that comes from, I think, a combination of words, but it just means yellow. Okay. That's all it means. But uh, it is associated with that which is uh, weighty. In the Old Testament, money was silver, not gold, right? Mm-hmm. And you had to pay those fees. You have redemption, silver, etc. But gold is regularly used of God his, in his, his character, okay? But here we don't have the seven, one lamp, seven lights, but, and they don't just sit up there. They are, in fact, part of the lamp. Okay, they're in part of that lamb. And those seven lamps are actually called the seven spirits of God. They're called the seven eyes of God. They're called the seven horns of God. And they all set upon the line of the tribe of Judah, who is the risen lamb. Jesus Christ is the menorah. He is the lamb. 
okay? Which is interesting because the spirit flows through that light. And we'll, we're going to see what, what he does with, with that here shortly here. So the seven spirits of God which are coming through there, it flows through him. So when he speaks, he says the spirit is, is trying to show you something. The spirit's talking. All right? I uh, kind of think. By the way, uh, there's, this is incredible to me. This is the, the first time. I, I, this, these movements began years ago. Um, when the, the, uh, the idea of the charisma or the spiritual gifts and things like that just went hyper and out of control. And now they're to the point right now that Jesus is literally does not belong in the church service because it's all about the spirit. Right? You see where I'm going? You can see this. You can see a hold up there. It's just the spirit, the spirit, the spirit, the spirit, the spirit, the spirit. When Jesus said, when the spirit comes, he's going to speak of me. And who is this spirit that doesn't speak of Jesus Christ, who only exalts and speaks of himself? Who is that spirit? I got a news for you. You know, did the spirit of God love you enough to die for you? He did not. Did he go into the grave for you? He did not. Did he rise from you? He did not. Is he the king? He's not. Who is? There's one mediator between God and man, and it's not him. It is Jesus himself. Amen. See it? Jesus Christ is our fullness. He is our everything. It's God's will that Jesus have the preeminence in everything. And who is this spirit that does not honor Jesus Christ, but wants you focused on him? And as long as he... Let me tell you who that spirit is. It's your... He, you feel him? You feel him? You feel him? Feel him? Feel him? That's the Holy Spirit. Feel him? Feel him? Feel him? What's with all this feely? Have you bowed your knees in the fear of God? Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? To get out of the flame to, which are, are, are awaiting men who die without Christ? You understand this? This is, this is, this is border... Not borderline. This is some witchcraft New Age movement rather than the focus upon the Son of God who loved us and has set us free from our sins. The Holy Spirit did not set me free from, from sin. The blood of Jesus did. Amen. So what does this thing do? The Spirit of God will, he will take the things of me, Jesus said, and he will show them to you. He's going to show you what? He's going to show you to that, right? Rather than going, oh, do you feel it? Do you feel it? Do you feel it? Do you feel it? All right. Jesus has come and died for us, born under the law, born under the curse, etc. Et All right. And it is the glory of God to give light to his people. And the light that flows to his people are the very words of Jesus himself, spoken through the prophets, anointed by the Spirit, and they take, uh, uh, etc. And shows you that. And, there, you know, we need to check ourselves to make sure that we're in the faith that's taught by God, not something that we have, in fact, made up. Now, these lamps are to be fashioned like almonds. I thought we had a, a replica of, of uh, one of those before. Everybody knows what an almond is. You've eaten almonds. Okay. Well, just grow, make that almond grow about 10 times that size, and you have, you have an, a Middle Eastern lamp. This is made of clay. Make it a little, little flat pancake thing like that. You can make a little cup, fold that thing over, pinch one end so you have a hole at the top and a little, little hole sitting there. <coughs> you pour olive oil in there, and, and now you have a lamp. You have, right, uh, kind of thing. And um, the Bible talks about those who are, are outside. It's called outer darkness because um, they used to have these lamps. They would burn a lamp all night long, like a nightlight, etc. And Proverbs says that precious oil, when things become... Precious is when they're scarce. Precious oil is found in the house of the wise. When things get when, short, uh, one of the things that uh, a wise woman has done is stored up for her home to keep the lights on, uh, as it were. All right. Now, this word for, for almond is shakad, and it means and translates. You Remember, this is a uh, Middle Eastern language, and it is a picture language. It's not like English at all, and certainly not like Greek uh, as well. So if I take the word shakad and I pick up my Hebrew lexicon and I look at all the ways that it's translated, I'm going to see it's, uh, to be alert, to watch, to be sleepless. Almond, almond tree, almond shaped, to form as an almond or the almond nut. That's a lot of options. Because it has the idea of watching and the, see the lamp? You see it? 
the lamp is, is showing you something, and there's the idea of, of those almond branches. Now, Jesus spoke of a woman who lost something very dear to her, and so she took in a little lamp and so she could look underneath everything because it allows her to see, right? That little almond shaped lamp allows her to see. Watch, watch, and keep watching is one of the things that Jesus would say. In Hebrew, he'd say, use the almond, use the almond, use the almond, keep seeing and keep looking because you're looking for, for someone like the woman. Well, we know Messiah is, is, we're waiting for him. We're waiting for him, and he has come. Right? Uh, so, it would appear that these are the almond sh shapes to show Israel. Like Jesus said, to stay awake and keep your eyes open, make sure you're seeing. <clears throat> this will be the light of God. <clears throat> As the psalm said, in his light you shall see light, and you're looking for the one who is his coming, the Son of God. Exodus 25 says, <clears throat> you shall make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand shall be made of hammered work, its base, its stem, its cups, its calyxes, calyx is like a wreath that goes around it, okay? Its flowers shall be of one piece with it. So they don't sit on there, it's actually one piece. And there shall be six branches going out of its side, three branches on the lampstand out to the uh, left side, and three branches going out to the other side. Three cups made like almond blossoms, each with its calyxes or its... Um, wreath and flower and one branch, and these cups sh uh, made like almond blossoms. Each of these wreath uh, calyxes are a flower and on the other branch. So also for the six branches going out of the lampstand and on the lampstand itself, there shall be four cups made like almond blossoms with the calyxes and the flowers and a calyx of one piece with it under each pair of the six branches going out from the lampstand. And the calyxes when their branches shall be of one piece with it, the whole of a single piece of hammered work and of pure gold, pure glory of, of God. And these shall be seven lamps for it, and the lamps shall be set up so as to give light on that space in front of it. And the tongs with their trays and, uh, are to be of pure gold, because everything that touches that is about God's glory. <clears throat> and remember the word glory it means weighty. This is important stuff. The light from God is very, very important. Very important. And it shall be made with all these utensils and the, with by a talent of pure gold. And see that you make these things after the pattern for them, which is being shown to you. Now, this is interesting because he said, what I'm showing you is a pattern that actually exists in heaven. This is a shadow and a type and a picture to show you what things are in heaven. That there is a light there and it's all there and everything is, is Jesus Christ is there. It's him. This is the Holy of Holies. This is all about him, as he said, the scripture said. Now, goodness. I took too long on the introduction, I think. But, uh, I hope, you know, this is week 11 in chapter 1. I'd like to finish next week with chapter 1 move on, but uh, we'll do what we've got to do. Um, I'm going to number 16. You do not need to go there. But there's something here I want to read to you. And... Uh, This is Numbers chapter 16. Now, there was an argument about who's going to be the priest and who can draw near to the Lord, right? It says, now, Korah, you heard of Korah's rebellion, the son of Ishar, the son of Korath, the son of Levi, and Dathan, and Abiram, and the sons of Eliab, on this, and the son of uh, Peleth, uh, sons of Reuben. These are the, Reuben's the firstborn, but he's not Levi. Right? <coughs> they took action. They rose up before Moses together and some of the sons of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation. 250 leaders. Now the congregation, we're talking about a nation. This would be like the house and the senate and they're all there in rebellion. Right? Chosen in the assembly, men of renown. These are important guys. And the assembly gathered against Moses and against Aaron, against them, and said, you guys have gone far enough. All the congregation is holy. Everybody here is just as holy as everybody else. Okay? Every one of them, and Yahweh is in their midst, so why do you exalt yourself? <clears throat> Moses, you're exalting yourself, and Aaron, you're exalting yourself. You think you're this special priest. 
you exalt yourself before the assembly of Yahweh. Now, this is important. Aaron means light bearer. He carries the light of Israel, and he's the high priest. He's the first high priest. And he is followed when he dies by Eliezer. That is God the comforter, God the strengthener, picture of the Holy Spirit. And, then, and of course, Moses is the lawgiver. When Mo Moses heard this, he fell on his face, and he spoke to Korah and to his company. He said, Tomorrow morning, Yahweh is going to show who is his and who is holy. If it's just the tribe of, if it's Aaron's family and the Levites, or if it's everybody, if God doesn't really care. So bring him, and he'll bring him near to himself, even to the one whom he will choose. Interesting, whom he will choose. The one whom he will, he's going to choose somebody specifically. And he will bring near to himself. Do this, take censers, these little plat, little small plate like things for putting incense in for prayers. Let us to draw near to God in prayer for yourselves, Korah, and all your company. And put fire in them and lay incense upon them in the presence of Yahweh tomorrow. Which is interesting. You see what he's done? Well, get your incense ready. You, you're going to walk into God's presence. We'll see how it works out. This has happened before. Do you remember Aaron's boys who tempted this? And the man whom Yahweh chooses, there's one man he's going to choose, and that's Aaron. Okay? And be the one who is holy. You have gone far enough, you sons of Levi. Now, this is a group of Levites, a group of Reubenites, and instead of these leaders. <laughs> then Moses said to Korah, Hear now, you sons of Levi, is it not enough for you that God has separated you from the rest of the congregation of Israel? The congregation of Israel is going to get their nations and their dirt and their soil. And houses that they didn't build, the Levites are not. The Levites are just going to get a handful of cities, okay? Because they're going to be focused on the temple and the tabernacle, etc. To do the service of the tabernacle of Yahweh and to stand before the congregation to minister to them. This is your job. You minister to these people. You don't join them in rebellion. And that has been brought you near Korah and all your, your brothers, sons of Levi with you? Question mark? You're going to do this? Are you seeking for the priesthood also? You're not exalted high enough, you're going to go further. Therefore, you and all the company, you're gathered together against Yahweh. But as for Aaron, who is he that you're going to grumble against him? Then Moses said, sent a summons to Dathan and Abiram and the sons of Eliab, and they said, we will not come up. No, you don't tell us what to do. Is it not enough that you have brought us up out of the land flowing with milk and honey for us to die? Where did he lead them out of? Bondage. What was going on to, what was happening to their kids? Drowning those little guys in the Niles and feeding them to the, to the gators, right, that kind of thing. Whipped and beaten, oh, the land of milk and honey. So we might die in the wilderness. You would also lord this over us. Now you're our lords. Indeed, you have not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey, but you have given us and you have given us inheritance of lands and vineyards. And would you put out the eyes of these people? We can obviously see it didn't happen. And we will not come up. Moses became very angry. Which is interesting because Moses said he's the meekest man who ever lived on the earth at this time. And this guy's meek, but he's you understand what he's doing? He's like kind of i got to tell you, as a pastor, as, as one of the elders here at Whitestone, there, there have been times when we dealt with sin and had to remove somebody from this body. That, that you go from mercy to just, I've had enough of you. Get out. Go away. You're just de defiant. You're vile. You're hateful. You don't want to harm people. That's why you're here. You're just here to exalt yourself and put others down and hurt people. You need to leave. You need to leave. And that's what these people are doing. And there is a time when it is righteous indignation to say no further, no more. Moses became angry. He said to Yahweh, do not regard the offerings that I have taken. A, I haven't taken a single donkey, donkey from them. One of the most lowly, unwanted things. I have not done any harm to any of them. And Moses said to Korah, you and all your company, you be present before Yahweh tomorrow, both you and they, along with Aaron. Each one of you take his fire pan, put incense on it, and each of you bring it in his censer before Yahweh. 250 fire pans. Also you and Aaron, and each of you bring his fire pan. So that each one took his own censers and he put fire on it. 
Okay. By the way, where did you get fire to offer incense to God? Do you remember? You get it from the bronze altar where the sacrifices take place. And when men light their own fire at their own house and decide to come outside of that sacrifice of Jesus Christ, that's the issue here. You use those coals to offer incense. All right. So you take the censer, put fire on it, and laid incense on it. And they stood at the doorway of the tent of meeting with Moses and Aaron. They haven't gone in yet, but they're at the doorway. Where'd you get, the, where'd you get this fire? This is called strange fire. What are you doing here? What are you doing? All right. So Korah assembled on all the congregation against them at the doorway of the tent of meeting, and the glory of Yahweh appeared to all the congregation. Remember this kind of glory? That cloud appears and it shows up. <clears throat> and Yahweh spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation that I may consume them instantly. This is going to happen quick. You better get away. And they fell on their faces and they said, Oh God, you God, the God of spirits of all flesh, when one man sins, this is Korah who's leading this thing, are you going to be angry with the entire congregation? And then Yahweh said to Moses, he said, speak to the congregation, saying, Get back from among the dwellings of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Moses rose and he went to Dathan and Abiram, not to Korah. He went to these other men who were with him. With the elders of Israel following him, and he spoke to the congregation, he said, Depart from the tents of this wick- these wicked men. Get away from this, this family, from this family. And touch nothing that belongs to them, lest you be swept away with all their sins. So they got back from among the dwellings of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Dathan and Abiram came out, and they stood in the doorway of the tents with their wives, their sons, and their little ones. And Moses said, By this you will know that Yahweh has sent me to do all of these deeds. For this is not my doing. If these men die the death of all men... If they suffer the fate of all men, then Yahweh has not sent me. But if Yahweh brings about an entirely new thing, and the ground opens up its mouth and swallows them up, and everything that belongs to them, then they will descend alive into Sheol. That's the word for Hades. Jesus said, I have the keys of Hades. This is Hades is Sheol. And you will understand that these men have spurned or mocked or defied Yahweh. And it came about as they finished saying all these words that the ground that was underneath them split open. The earth opened up its mouth and swallowed them up and their households and all the men all along with Korah and his possessions. These vile men took their families to their death with them. And it's not God's fault that they destroyed their own families. So they and all that belonged to them, they went down alive into Sheol. And the earth closed over them. And they perished in the midst of the assembly. And all Israel who were around them, they fled at the loud cries. For they said, the earth will swallow us up. Fire also is going to come out from Yahweh and consume these 250 men who were offering the incense. Yahweh spoke to Moses and he said, say to Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the son of the light bearer, Eliezer, God the comforter, which is what his name means, the, the priest, that he shall take up the censers out of the midst of the blaze. Things are still burning there. Go pick up those censers <coughs> because they are holy. These guys, some of these guys are Levites, and this is to approach me, and scatter their burning coals abroad. As for the censers, these bronze brass plates, okay, of these men who have sinned at the cost of their lives, let them be made into hammered sheets, for the plating of the altar, the bronze altar, and also the other altar um, for cleansing. But, and since they did pre- uh, present them before Yahweh, and they are holy. The, the men weren't, but those things are. And they shall be for a sign to the sons of Israel. So Eliezer, the priest, he took the bronze censers, and those men who had, had burned uh, had, them had offered, and they hammered them out to place for the altar as a reminder to the sons of Israel that no layman... You're not a Le- Aaron. This is the job of Aaron. You can't do it if you're a Levite. You've got to be a tribe of Aaron, who is not of the descendants of Aaron, should come near to burn incense before Yahweh. That is, I'm going to go to God on my own. You priests step aside. And, and no, that's a bad idea. These types and pictures are very real because they manifest and mirror the pattern. This is the pattern. The reality is in heaven. To trying to uh, approach God and defy his people and defy his orders and his commandments and his teachings, that he might not become like Korah and his company. 
as Yahweh has spoken to him through Moses. So you come up to God, you see those fire pans, and that's a warning to us, don't do what those men did. Right? Now, but on the next day, the congregation, the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron, saying, you are the ones who have caused the death of the Lord's people. You know, <laughs> God's people all since Genesis and to today, if you read a book on church history, church history is a mess. It reads just like the Old Testament. You guys did this. It came about that one over the congregation had assembled up against Moses and Aaron that they turned towards the tent of meeting and behold, the cloud covered it and the glory of Yahweh appeared. <laughs> Whoa. This can't end well. Then Moses and Aaron came to the front of the tent and, and Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, Get away from among the whole congregation that I may consume them instantly. And they fell on their faces. I'll tell you what, there's been times in church history, no doubt God has wanted to do this again. And sometimes he punishes the church severely until it's almost gone. And at the last minute, when things go to the dog, the dog dies. And God has mercy upon his people. You know, I've been sent videos and articles to read on the, you know, how to save the United States. I'll tell you what the problem in the United States is right now. It's you and it's me. It's not what's going on. It's none of that other stuff matters. Did you know that like 57% of pastors use pornography? Do you see a problem? Yes. Are they in trouble? Are their congregations in trouble? Of course they are. And you think the problem's the Democrats? How dare you? How dare you? The wages of sin is death. And when we're defying God like this, and you think he's going to do nothing, well, he will. He'll take our country, he'll take our blessings, and he'll take everything from us. He will, you know, and it won't be anybody else's fault in the world. All right. Moses said to Aaron, take your censers and put it upon the fire of the altar and, and lay incense upon it quickly and go out in the congregation and make atonement for them for wrath has gone out from before the Lord and the plague has begun. These people began, to, it's literally a wave of plague starts going across the congregation. Aaron took it as Moses had spoken. He ran into the midst of the assembly, for behold, the plague had begun among the people, so that he put on the incense. There's his, his intercede, talking with God and prayer to God. He made atonement for those people. He took his stand between the dead and the living, which is where Jesus stands today. Between the dead and the living, so the plague was stopped right there. Now notice, the one whom they were defying, Aaron the light bearer, is actually the one who will save their lives all right. But those who died by the plague, 14,700 of them, besides those who died on account of Korah. And Aaron turned to Moses at the doorway of the tent of meaning, because the plague had been, been stopped. Then the Lord said to Moses, he said, Speak to the sons of Israel, and get from them a rod from each of your father's household. It would be the tribe. Twelve rods. Aaron's would make 13. There are 13 tribes of Israel, even though there are only 12 mentioned in all of the lists. There are many lists of the tribes, but there are only 12, but there are 13 tribes. From all those leaders, according to their father's household, and you will write each one their name on that rod. You know what, what the rod is, shepherd's rod, okay. And write Aaron's name on the rod of Levi, and there is one rod for the head of each of the father's households. You shall then deposit them in the tent of meeting, inside the holy place in the front of the testimony where I will meet with you and will come about that the rod of the man whom I choose will sprout and thus uh, I shall lessen from upon myself the grumbling of the sons of Israel who are grumbling against you. Now so, <coughs> this is going to define who's going to represent him. One man will represent him and he says, I'm going to end this once for all. Put them in there. So Moses therefore spoke to the sons of Israel and the leaders, and he gave him a rod apiece, and each leader according to their father's household, twelve rods and the rods of Aaron among their rods. These rods, by the way, could be, would identify tribes, tribal, tribal rods. And so Moses deposited the rods before Yahweh in the tent of testimony. It came about on the next day that Moses went into the tent of testimony. Behold, the rod of Aaron and the house of Levi had sprouted. It put forth its bud, so he brings out this rod, and it's like a bush, right? This thing's got flowers on it. He said it produced blossoms, and it bore ripe almonds. Wow. Do you remember what the almonds are about? The almonds are associated with light and watching and seeing, right? And God has just told you, I'm going to show you once and for all. And this is the one that you're looking for. We're not even going to get close to 
finish up to here, but I'll try and wrap up here just as quickly as possible. Moses then brought out all these from the presence of Yahweh to all the sons of Israel, and they looked each man to his rod, and the Lord said to Moses, put back the rod of Aaron before the testimony to be kept. Here is a sign. It's a sign of somebody in heaven who will rise from the dead and bear fruit. And this is the one like those almonds. This is who you're, the light, this is who you're looking for. And these rebels will put an end to their grumbling against me so they should not die. And Moses did just as the Lord had done. Okay. Now, in Jeremiah, the very first chapter, he says, Jeremiah, I've raised you up. You're going to be set for the rise and the falling of, of empires and kingdoms. That's cited in Luke of that baby when Jesus was a baby. Jesus is the Jeremiah who would be set for the rising and falling. And uh, there's no way to translate verses 11 and 12. What he says, what do you see? It basically says, I see an almond branch. And God says, this, therefore, I am going to almond or watch over my word to fulfill my word. So um, if, everybody knows what a willow is. So it would be like saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? It says, I see a willow. And the Lord says, well, this is what I willow do to you. Okay. But it's a picture of the, the Lord Jesus Christ who is going to be that almond, who's going to be that light. This is what you're watching for, the one who's going to be raised up to do those things. And in Jeremiah 31, he uses the word almond two more times. And it came about that when they watched, uh, it says, As I watched over them to pluck them up and break down, to overthrow, destroy, and bring harm. So I will watch over them, there's that word again, to build and to plant. And he describes these things. So <clears throat> this is the light before the presence of God. <coughs> Excuse me. Ephesians 5, away from the sleep, arise from the dead, Christ will give you light. Where does he get his light? It's that heavenly light from the presence of God. It is the almond branches. It is, it is that light that comes through there. Now, I hope to get through some sections of Zechariah. We're not going to do that today. I won't bore you with all that. But uh, this is the one who's there. This is the one. This is the Lord Jesus who was prophesied through all these symbols, all these types, these shadows, these patterns. And this is the Lord Jesus Christ who's addressing the church, right? He's dealing with us. He's dealing with me and dealing with you, you know. And it's an act of mercy like the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 11 where he says, God's taken some of you home. He just took your lives and took you home. Uh, it would be my prayer that if I was going to have a blowout and be immoral or something like that, that God would take me home first. It would be an act of mercy, not judgment. I wouldn't see that as judgment. I would say, I would get, get there and look at him and say, thank you. Thank you very much. Not to mention, to depart and be with the Lord is far better, right? Better to be there and at peace with him than to be here and be in trouble. What did Malachi say about God's character changing? <coughs> you know, it happened, okay? 1 Corinthians 10, Paul takes three Old Testament stories, grumbling and, and they're, they're dealing with appetites and their idolatry. And he said, these things were written for examples for us that we should not do that. Why would an Old Testament, meant, what God did to men in the Old Testament, why would I want to see that? But he says, this is your example. This is what God does. When you behave this way, this is what he does. Right? And so I can read all the way from Genesis to Revelation, and so can you. And I realize if I go down this road, this is how God will deal with me. If I go down this road, this is how God will deal with me. It goes well with the righteous. It goes well with with them. And you will not go wrong. I promise you. I can't always tell any, anybody what God's going to do in their life in, in most, most cases, but I can tell you it will go well. What will it look like? That will be worked out between you and the Lord. Between you and the Lord. You know, I, I, I got a call from one of our elders years ago when I was in Council Idaho. And um, <clears throat> There was a Christian police officer who had left his, he was, a, he was one of the teachers at his church, teaching Sunday school and some things like that. Well, he left and left his wife and his kids and his church and he moved in with some young lady. And um, the elder who was working there at the police department, he said, listen, here's the thing, I'm, I'm working here, I can't really deal with this. I don't know what to deal with this, but something needs to be done with this. And so I went to the jail and, and he called him in and I said, can I chat with you? And, and, he, and he, we spoke and I said, what you're, you know, what you're doing is wrong. You need to go back. I says, has your church talked to you about this? No. Has your pastor even talked to you about this? He said, no. Nobody said a word. Kind of thing. Do you know the word rebuke is the word epitome? Epi means upon and tome means value. To place value upon somebody. 
Why would you rebuke your child? He's valuable to you. Why would you rebuke your sinning friend, your best friend if he's sinning? Because he's valuable and his wife is valuable to you. And let me tell you something. I know how much you value him if you do nothing. He's not worth spit to you. You can say what you want. He's just a fluffy puppy dog. He's cute, but if you get bit, you're going to go away. All right. So I met with this man, and I told him, you know, you're a Christian. This is wrong. You need to leave there, and you need to go home and deal with this. And he said, let me think about it. So he, I went home, and I, and I met with him the next day, and I said, what are you going to do? You're going to leave home? He said, I'm not. I said, then, you know, I'm, I'm going to do something about this. He said, what are you going to do? And I said, I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do. He had just graduated from officer, the police officer training school in Boise. So I wrote them a letter. Because in that letter, a police officer, when they graduate from that academy, they have to sign a paper that I will never do anything to dishonor or embarrass my community, my family, my police department, etc. So I said, this man has left his wife, left his kids, he's embarrassed his family, he's embarrassed his church, he's embarrassed his police department, he's embarrassed this community. I said, if this is nothing but a formality, and doesn't mean anything, then please disregard my letter. Well, they took him out and fired that letter right back to the department, uh, to the <laughs> chief of police. He got the letter, called one of the elders in from, from my church and called him in and said, what are you doing? Are you trying to destroy us? What are you trying to do? He said, I don't have anything to do with this. They called that officer in who had been cheating on his wife and fired him. And his life just went downhill from there. Well, you know what? I don't know the conclusion of this because I don't know what he, what he has done. But he's worth that. And, you know, even in the Old Testament, he says, when you see your, your neighbors doing things wrong, rebuke them. Tell them this is wrong, right? And for certainly, if you value people, you, you're going to do it that way. Let me tell you why church discipline isn't done. Because if you did church discipline across our, our land, how many people would stay in those churches? They'd be empty in churches, wouldn't they? They'd be leaving. You're just mean. You're just all these other things. No, you're walking in obedience to the Lord. And it certainly beats the earth opening up and... <laughs> Kind of thing. And the Lord said, get away from those people. And when you remove that wicked man from among yourself in 1 Corinthians 5, he said, don't eat, don't eat with him. Get away from him. He will defile you because if you, you know. The holiness of God, the judgments of God, the fear of God missing in Christianity in a big way, in a big way. Everybody's singing about the love of God, but the love of God is, remember what Jesus said, it's only one thing. It's do my commandments. I don't want anything else from you. That's the definition of it. It's nothing else. That's all it is. Father, we love you and praise you. Thank you for the word of God. Lord Jesus, as we look at you and see your posture towards your people, as you speak with a sword, the bronze burning fiery feet of yours from your walk and the judgments that you inflict, we see the band of gold and the glory of God is what matters in your affections and your heart for your people. And it's the most important thing for all of us, for our children, for our very lives, our marriages. Let us not be lacking in the fear of God. But to honor you in every way, to worship you acceptably. Not to defy you like Korah did, just saying we'll do whatever we want to do in the church and that you'll just sit idle and not do anything. That's, that's madness. You are the king of all kings and greater than we can even know. We'll never know how great you are. It is not possible to think outside of the creation. And we're part of that. We are the creatures now. And we do worship you, Lord. Thank you for our time together. May we magnify you in every way that is pleasing to you. So you can say to us on, on that day, well done, good and faithful servant. In your holy name we pray. Amen and amen.